Okay, so I'm going to talk about right-wing populism on the periphery uh, of Europe, and this is like a very self-conscious uh, title uh, highlighting that uh, Tur Turkey uh, occupies a special place. Uh, it is, um, you know, it's on the frontier of Europe, right outside, and I'll compare it to uh, countries right, you know, quote unquote, inside, that's very debatable, inside uh, Europe. And so we'll, we'll try to see, you know, uh, how, how, um, how much the populisms in the three places, in, in you know, uh, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, um, how much they're similar and how different they are. So, uh, first of all, um, let, let me, you know, give you a broad map of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about neoliberalization and these three right-wing regimes as counter movements, uh, counter movements within the context of neoliberalization. It doesn't mean they're anti-neoliberal, but we'll discuss that. And if they're all, if all three of them are counter movements, why are they different and what are the similarities? So I'll, I'll, in, before I go into the details, I'll quickly point out some of the basic similarities and some of the basic differences. And then I'll try to answer this uh, question, the main question of the talk, why the differences, by focusing on political economy, uh, civic legacies, and then uh, world imperial uh, balances. And then I'll wrap up with a summary and hopefully we'll have a rich discussion. So the, the background to all of this is the dashing of liberal hopes, uh, which had peaked in the 1990s and 2000s. What were these liberal hopes? Uh, well, uh, primarily it was uh, that the market would induce welfare. So the, the market would, you know, the rising uh, tide lifts all boats kind of thinking. Everybody will be fine if we turn towards the market and work more, of course. And that's not, uh, that's not it by itself. There was also a promise of peace that came through invasions, of course. Uh, first, uh, starting with small invasions um, in Africa and some smaller places in Asia, then leading to the bigger invasions in the beginnings of the 2000s. So these uh, American invasions were also um, you know, supposed to bring market peace to both Europe and its broader region. So that there would be a market peace and all of these societies would fit together. So even the boundaries of the EU itself would not be that important. Uh, but things started not to work out uh, so well. So first there was the 2008 financial collapse and as I will try to point out, this didn't immediately hit uh, Turkey uh, and uh, the other peripheral regimes. But then there was also the, all the deadlocks in the American or NATO occupied countries. And then came the Arab Spring and maybe this was the you know, false peak of the hopes because um, you know, everybody in the mainstream from the New York Times to The Economist uh, were thinking that you know, ultimately this is going to uh, bring the market peace. Yeah, the invasions didn't quite, but now the Arab Spring will establish liberal democracies, but as we know, that didn't happen, and I have a separate book about that actually, why that didn't happen. But uh, the, the way that would impact the following 10 years was the creation of these millions of refugees. And then th there was a, another uh, short false spring for peripheral countries, not just European peripheral countries, but throughout the world, including Latin America. So the, the money that escaped the Western world as a result of the 2008 uh, crash went to the so-called emerging, emerging markets, uh, what I call the periphery instead, instead of emerging markets. So for several years, actually, countries like Brazil and Turkey um, you know, somewhat benefited, I mean, it's all debatable, of course, but somewhat benefited from the 2008 crash. So what is the counter movement against all of this? So the AKP regime in Turkey is 
one of the most perplexing in the whole world because it's a right-wing regime, quite dictatorial, but it integrates refugees. And uh, this is very uh, confusing uh, for those especially not following the Merkel deal, but I will try to tell you it's not, it's not just the Merkel deal, it's way more structural than that, you know, the reason this regime tries to integrate refugees. But the other confusing thing about uh, the regime is that uh, as a part of its counter movement, it both deepens neoliberalization, but it deepens something that appears quite anti-neoliberal. It deepens state capitalism. The third confusing thing is that uh, it's, it strikes a very Western, anti-Western tone, but it's a part of Western military uh, coalitions and arguably uh, the, the broader Western financial and political and diplomatic world, as we have been seeing in the last two days, if you're following the details, if not, we can cover it in the Q&A session. So very interesting uh, developments in the last 48 hours. So the Polish counter movement with respect to neoliberalization is you know, somewhat similar to the Turkish, but also very different. So when you first look at Hungary and Poland, on the surface, they're all very similar. They're you know, right wing, they're authoritarian, uh, they, they, from, from a liberal point of view, they're anti-neoliberal. But I'll try to argue that, that it's, that's not so easy. Uh, I, I don't think neo, they're anti-neoliberal, but we'll discuss that. So uh, the, Poland's uniqueness is that even though it has a developmental, it has had a developmentalist model and it has had non-neoliberal policies, not just under its right-wing government uh, ever since 2015, but maybe for the last 15 years or so, it it's still uh, is deepening marketization. So in that regard, it looks like Turkey, but as I'm saying, the, develop, the economic policies are even more developmental, not just simply state capitalists. They, they have this strong developmentalist ethos. We'll come to why that is the case. And uh, it, it is like the other two regimes, like the Hungarian and Turkish regime, regimes in, in its authoritarianism and uh, you know, anti-EU value talk, but it is much more aligned with the integration of Europe. And despite all spats with the EU, it, it keeps more uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatically positive relations with the EU. The Hungarian counter movement is a variation on all of these themes. It's much thinner in its developmentalism. So you see a specific kind of state capitalism that is less developmentalist, and I'll tell you uh, what I mean by that as we go into the details. It has relied on an apparently anti-EU stance, but it is very much dependent on Europe, actually, especially Germany. And both regimes, unlike the Turkish regime, both, both the Hungarian and Polish regimes are uh, explicitly very anti refugee, so they, they fit uh, the right-wing stereotype more than the Turkish one does. So what explains the differences? Uh, three hypotheses, and not all of these are supported equally, but uh, we can talk about that later, uh, maybe in the discussion part. So uh, first, political economy, and political economy has at least, uh, you know, to, even this is a simplification, but the, uh, the political economy I will talk about has at least three dimensions, the accumula accumulation and welfare regimes in these three countries, the relative strength of the domestic capitalist classes in each country, and then the, the broader social coalitions, socio-political uh, coalitions, these leading domestic bourgeoisies have built. So that's the political economy part. The second, of course, not completely independent from this, but semi-autonomous from this political economy, are the civic and ideological legacies in these three countries. Uh, and here we see a lot of differences, actually. Uh, and I'll try to talk uh, about some of these uh, as much as uh, like a short talk as this one allows. And then there are these countries, specific places in, in, and roles in world capitalism and overall inter-imperialist rivalry. 
So let's start with Turkey. So Turkey starts as a very classical neoliberal case, at least on the surface. You know, when, when you read some, uh, even like borderline heterodox econo economists, you see that it, it was never like, you know, like straight uh, forward textbook neoliberal, but at least the way it was covered in uh, the international press, again, you know, Economist, um, you know, Financial Times, New York Times. So this is what you would see. Trade liberalization, hot cash flaws, uh, very positive privatization that creates independent businesses. Of course, you know, that, that, was, that was the biggest lie uh, from the beginning. You know, privatization didn't create independent businesses. And then the critical literature uh, focused on the deunionization part of this uh, apparently straightforward neoliberalization. Then uh, th th that was, you know, 1980s, 1990s. That, that first line continued also into the 2000s. Then in the 2000s, after the Justice and Development Party, or AKP, with its uh, acronym, uh, came to power, it added health policies to this. It added direct cash transfers. And we shouldn't look at this as anti-neoliberal either, but you know, this st starts to introduce the idea of counter-movement. So welfare policies that can go together with neoliberalization. And of course, the AKP itself didn't create these. The World Bank and IMF uh, suggested these policies. Not all countries in, uh, you know, put them into effect with the same effectivity, uh, but Turkey was very effective because, you know, the, the, um, well, the because is later, actually. So, but for now, I can tell you these were pretty effective, uh, except in education. So they, they de-emphasized the educational part of what the World Bank and uh, the IMF were suggesting as uh, social uh, neoliberalism. So what was less visible or less covered in the international uh, press uh, and even in some of the critical literature in Turkey, in, in this very first decade of more straightforward neoliberalization, was a state-boosted construction sector, and everything from you know, small buildings to mega projects, where big and small construction firms were created, and uh, the, you know, lots of winners all picked by, not all, but the bigger ones picked by the government, handpicked by the uh, government. So you know, that, that privatization was always you know, somewhat non-neoliberal or non-textbook uh, neoliberal from the get-go. So the, the privatization didn't create independent businesses. And, uh, th this privatization, uh, the, or I mean, the, not, not the privatization, this state-led construction sector <laughs> also created a huge pool of construction workers who, uh, you know, prefer insecure jobs and, uh, you know, uh, semi-employment to straightforward unemployment, which had characterized the 1980s and 1990s. So this is what... Turkey has looked like for, for, the, for the last two decades or so, or maybe you know, two to four decades, but definitely intensified. This, uh, this kind of appearance intensified in the 2000s and 2010s. Construction everywhere, shoddy construction um, boosted by the government. So in the 2010s, we start to see something different we start to see the mobilization of state capitalist tools without completely doing away with this overall neoliberal uh, orientation that is characterized by uh, privatization and uh, financialization, but trade liberalization gets dropped from the agenda. And what they add is some import substitution, not as systematic as in the 1960s, 1970s, sovereign wealth funds, which means you know, the government puts together a lot of money and starts to direct uh, development uh, through these uh, semi-secret, sometimes completely secret funds. And then the picking of national champions. So what was being done is semi-secretively, mostly secretively in the 2000s, you know, the government picking capitalist winners, now starts to be done pretty publicly and as a matter of like national pride. You know, these are our national capitalists. And many of these uh, national capitalists are concentrated in the war industry. So they make drones, they make tanks, they make battleships, I mean, serious war industry, and they want to do more. 
we'll, we'll discuss or we, we can discuss maybe later if they can do more. But uh, as you know, in the Ukrainian invasion, uh, the, the Turkish drones have become pretty important. Uh, even Fukuyama was you know, ecstatic uh, about how effective Turkish drones were. Uh, so, it, but it's not only that, so there's the visible part, but then there are sub-industries of this war industry, a huge expansion in the uh, metal sector. And, you know, the metal sector is not just one thing. I mean, it's like a chain of businesses and in industries and sub-industries. So all of these policies have strengthened what I call the state capitalist bourgeoisie. So in the, in the construction sector, there are also, you know, like smaller and medium-sized businesses, which I wouldn't call the state capitalist uh, in the, uh, bourgeoisie, but there are also like these giant state capitalist uh, uh, bourgeois uh, families also in the construction sector. But when it comes to the war industry, of course, I mean, the, you, don't, you don't have a lot of small businesses. It's usually... Uh, huge businesses, uh, very visible, uh, but, but their production is not visible. It's, it's usually in, in the hinterland of uh, Istanbul. So what about labor, though? That, that, that part also has become very in interesting because unlike this uh, very compliant construction labor, construction sector labor, the metal sector, the metal industry labor is very concentrated. And as we know from history, from Bismarck, from uh, like uh, so pre-Soviet Russia, right before Soviet Russia, th that, that's where you get most of the action, you know, war industries, metal uh, sub-war industries. So the same thing happens in Turkey. Uh, you, you see the biggest, wildest strikes uh, of the neoliberal era. Th there were bigger formal strikes at the end of the 1980s, but the biggest wildest strikes come in 2015 among pro-government workers. So the workers who engage in these actions are mostly far-right nationalists and Islamists, or at best center-rightists, most of them. So the government first uh, cracks down on these, but then does something much smarter in the following years. It, it, as in, uh, you know, in hand in hand with, his, uh, with its uh, deunionization, the government starts corporatist unionization. So the unionization rates uh, among pro-government people uh, triple, more than triple. So these Turkish Islamic unions are not, of course, like, you know, the, the unions we know. They, they, they're weak, very weak in mobilizational capacity, but uh, they have many hands out, handouts and they build a social world. Uh, they give Islam, they provide Islamic education. So they, they build, like, you know, small neighborhoods, really, in, in, in factories. So this is very much modeled, of course, after uh, corporatist, uh, fascist Italy. Um, so the, the clear losers of all of this is on the, first, on the one hand, old organized labor, that, that keeps losing throughout this era. So the wildcat strikes don't do much for uh, old organized labor. And the educated middle classes. So they continue suffering into the 2000s and 2010s. Well, not, not 2000s, sorry. This is like post-financial uh, post crash. So the educated middle classes, post-financial crash, start to suffer in Turkey. So this is uh, for a picture from the uh, wildcat strikes, uh, massive events, uh, but without any resultant uh, militant uh, unionization. Instead, they end up in corporatist unionization. So, you know, that's the political economy, but there's also the civic basis of the regime built through uh, what I and my colleagues, De Leon and Desai, have called the integral party. So when we say the integral party, we don't just mean the official membership of the party, its official chapters. Well, there's that too. I mean, the party has 11, millions, 11 million uh, members and it has a lot of organized activity. Uh, but you see political scientists and political sociologists disagreeing about the quality and consistency of that activity. But when we say integral party, we mean something much bigger than these official chapters. Uh, we also mean the countless civic organizations 
that, that are in the orbit of the party. And what has characterized these organizations, especially post-2008, is that they live in a perpetual state of paranoia. You know, Erdogan and the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, are doing something very important. And whatever bad is happening in the world is actually meant to undermine Erdogan. 2008 crash, that's all about Erdogan. That's the financial lobby globally. They are doing that against Erdogan. Something unlike that happens, that's also bad for Turkey. Well, that's again, you know, uh, meant to undermine Erdogan. But, you know, this is not just, uh, th this kind of par paranoia is not just a part of official propaganda. It's also in, in the uh, capillaries of society. All of these organizations in neighborhoods, uh, aid organizations, associations of clerical school graduates. So all of this neighborhood presence and also middle class uh, presence. So this, this is, you know, the non-secular middle class, uh, professional asso associations. And now the unions, so workplaces, neighborhoods, they all live in this constant state of paranoia. We are doing something very important here. Erdogan is doing something very important here. And the whole world is out there to get us. Okay. So th this state of, you know, constant activity and constant paranoia, along with organization, uh, guided by the party, brings me to my last point, which is this Again, like this constant mobilization, state society, not just society, not just the bureaucrats, not just the military, but all of them hand in hand. The military personnel, the deep state, the civic bureaucrats, the party, civic associations, they all live with this mission. You know, Turkey's place is changing in the world and we need to do our part for this. Okay, to, to sustain this transformation, to sustain this rise of Turkey. So why is this happening? First, a structural analysis and then uh, quickly into what uh, Erdogan and the AKP are doing about this. So the, the structural part is that American imper imperialism is uh, declining without any clear uh, project or leader emerging on the horizon. And of course, you will say, what about China? Of, of course, China is the uh, clear alternative, but it doesn't, you know, unlike the Soviets, it doesn't have an alternative vision of a world. So even if it's, uh, even its state capitalism is dependent on American uh, neoliberalism. So there is that, there is the decline, uh, the decline of American imperialism uh, and rising in inter-imperialist rivalry, but without an alternative bloc that you can really, really side with against America. And the declining significance of the EU overall, its near disintegration, and also the unwillingness of the EU to integrate Turkey, which has become very clear uh, by the end of the two, 2000s, before the 2010s. So, as a response to these two structural factors, uh, Erdogan and the Justice and Development Party, the AKP, repositioned Turkey not as anti-West, as their uh, rhetoric frequently sounds, but as a broker between the East and the West, between EU and the US and the Gulf states and occasionally Iran, occasionally they're anti-Iran, and between Russia and China. So the thinking is not simply that Turkey is a bridge, because you know that, that's that's old news. Uh, Turkey always said that we are a, a bridge between the East and the West. Now the thinking is remanipulating this function as a bridge to open up space for Turkey's own sub-imperial project. So this is also how the vision of the military is changing. So this is not just in the head of Erdogan. So the, uh, the Turkish military is also uh, reconsidering its role in NATO. It's not becoming anti-NATO, but it's thinking, a lot of uh, military leaders are thinking, we can do something bigger than just being an extension of NATO. And uh, one manifestation of uh, that is uh, the blue homeland fantasies of the Turkish military, uh, which the AKP has turned into a more Islamic uh, Ottomanist fantasy, and the Mediterranean energy 
policy. So Turkey is a part of the, the energy wars now in the Mediterranean, and it's not simply serving the uh, US or NATO as it used to, but it is still serving the NATO. So it's, it's like a very interesting change of role. It's doing both, you know, being, uh, being a sub-imperial uh, uh, power in its own right, but still a part of Western imperialism. And of course, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Ukraine war, these are all opening up new space for Turkey. And uh, you can see very clear manifestations of this in the Ukraine war too. Uh, Turkey is not simply pro-NATO, it's not simply uh, pro-Ukraine, it's not simply pro-Russia either. So it's playing everybody against each other, except of course in the last two days where it appears very pro-NATO, but again, we can discuss that. So, what I'm arguing then is that, you know, the, these three elements of the analysis really come together. You know, there's state capitalism in the making, the expansion of the war industry, so the regime's political economy, and the perpe perpetual civic paranoia are uh, props for, these, uh, for this imperial or inter-imperial uh, reckoning or reconsideration of Turkey's role. So ju just to reiterate this, the turn to state capitalism, the bottom-up mobilization by the regime, by the party, and uh, Turkey's sub-imperial um, adventures all feed into each other. So this is this is the blue homeland. You know th this is uh, this is the most modest uh, imperial fantasy, th as voiced by the military. So the the Turkish military now thinks Turkey should go beyond what was uh, the, the the geography appointed to it by international treaties, and it should control this entire uh, area. Uh, but as, as I'm saying, you know, when you read about this, this is as it is seen by the military. This is a military a map drawn by uh, a general. But when you read how the Islamists are uh, thinking about this in the Islamist newspapers, they think, well, this is a small part of it. Of course, we want to expand all the way to the Atlantic and all the way into Central Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this, I would argue, explains Turkey's allegedly, apparently pro-refugee position. Of course, there's a Merkel deal. I mean, everybody here knows about it. So it's you know cash in in, in exchange for keeping refugees at bay so that they don't enter the EU. Uh, yes, yeah, there there is that part of it, but. Uh, I'm arguing that this uh, apparently pro-refugee stance also goes hand in hand with the war industries and the sub-imperialist aspirations of the government. Uh, first, there is the you know ideological, um, it's like the superstructural of this. Re refugees, immigrants, diversity—they're also always very important. You know, in empires, you know, the, the empires are al always or have been always, at least on the surface, more <laughs> cosmopolitan. So this, this cosmopolitanism is a part of the AKP's imperial identity. But uh, the refugees also serve as cheap labor for war industries, but more so for the sub-industries uh, of war capitalism. And the other thing is that th they are very absorbable by all of these aid associations. So even though there are millions of refugees, they're not as big of a burden on uh, the public infrastructure and the welfare state as they would be elsewhere because welfare itself is already privatized, semi-privatized, and all of these aid associations can uh, pick, uh, pick up a part of the slack. And, you know, it's, it's really like a... A uh, two-sided uh, two benefit for the government because the integration of refugees as non-citizens, or only like, like a very small portion of them get citizenship, their integration as non-citizens strengthens aid activism 
Okay, so the more there are refugees in neighborhoods, the more these informal Islamic aid associations become important in these neighborhoods. But as importantly, they divide the working class. So uh, the workers start to uh, focus on their uh, skirmishes and clashes with Afghans, with Syrians, etc., instead of you know focusing on uh, the, their uh, conflicts with their bosses. But it's not a rose garden without thorns for the AKP. The problem is that uh, a lot of anti-Syrian and anti-Afghan uh, feeling sentiments feed into anti-AKP nationalism. Uh, so the secular parties are now trying to uh, mobilize the people against the current uh, history. I'll, I'll argue that it's the, the embodied dispositions of its leaders are quite similar to the embodied dispositions, embodied orientations of the leaders of the AKP and very different from the embodied orientations of, uh, of the Polish uh, right-wing party. What do I mean by embodied dispositions? The way these leaders feel, the way they sell themselves to the people, and the way people read them. So this is like a, you know, a performative reading, but it's not a performance based on nothing. So it's not a performance that you choose on the spot, as in most of the per performative literature. This is per performative um, choice that is deeply embedded in history. But what is that history? In, in, in Turkey, the history is Islamic mobilization. In Hungary, it is anti-communist mobilization, but that anti-communist mobilization is very specific. So if you look at who Orban is, uh, Orban is, something, is somebody who uh, imitated not just, you know, not, well, not, not, not just, specifically not Hungary's right-wing uh, legacy and right-wing heroes. He imitated the left libertarian heroes of Hungary's past. So the leaders of 1848, the leaders of 1956, and again, the left libertarian leaders of, of these uh, movements. But uh, these leaders were heroized uh, through decommunizing their identities. So they imitated the uh, anti-Russia or anti-Soviet Russia uh, leaders of the 1956 uprising, but they took out uh, their communist identities. Uh, these were you know, communist leaders uh, fighting against Soviet invasion in 1956. So that's just a part of it though. So uh, what uh, Fides also integrates into its package is the fascist challenge to liberalism. So there's also like a fascist, properly <coughs> racist party uh, that has mobilized against liberalism in Hungary and they have integrated its agenda too into Fides. And then uh, through his Twitter and other social media profiles, Orban also um, you know, paints a very liberal uh, picture, like a classical liberal fighting against government type of uh, picture. Well, of course, in a very national conservative way. So the, the fight is, you know, sounds liberal. It's anti-bureaucracy. Uh, anti and of course, that uh, jibes very well with the uh, 1956 spirit. So in other words, all of this is a national conservative absorption of libertarian left, fascist, and liberal elements to fight pure neoliberalism. And what is the fight against pure neoliberalism? It is a national capitalist twist to uh, neoliberalism. And due to all, all of these uh, integrations of these legacies, the party is able to mobilize the masses and organize the masses. Maybe not as much as in Turkey. I wouldn't say, you know, Fidesz is in every neighborhood, every street uh, in half of the country, like the AKP and the uh, AKP's uh, fascist coalition partner uh, are. Uh, so that they're not as integrated into neighborhoods and streets, but due to these uh, civic uh, legacies, they are able to play this organized, mobilized, mass party card unlike Europe. 
So it's, uh, it's important to note that uh, er Erdogan is one of uh, Orban's heroes, along with uh, Putin. Uh, but of course, in, within the last year or so, he hasn't been able to uphold Putin that much. So now uh, he upholds Erdogan whenever he can. He announces him as the biggest fighter for peace in the world. Orban says, you know, Erdogan is the biggest fighter for peace in the world. He was the first leader. Uh, to congratulate Erdogan on his election victory be before there was a victory. So you know, it, it get, gives you a sense of their relationship and it's a one-way relationship. I mean, uh, Erdogan doesn't have the same enchantment with him. So I should emphasize uh, the, the third um, component of this mixture. The, the Hungarian rights position against Europe, even though it sounds as harsh as Erdogan's position against Europe, is very defensive. It sound, sounds aggressive, but its content is defensive. So the Hungarian right positions Hungary as the repository of true European values, meaning, you know, pro-family, anti-feminist, anti-LGBTQ. And its main theme is protecting Europe not only from feminist and LGBTQ attacks, but against immigration. And of course, the thinking is that uh, Soros and the EU are organizing all of the uh, immigrant, uh, quote-unquote, attack against uh, Europe. So Hungary is not just protecting itself, it certainly is doing that, but it is also protecting Europe from immigrants, uh, which will uh, dilute its identity. So the, the other thing is, as important as this uh, defensive positioning, is that there are no war industries in Hungary. So, and th there is no huge metal industry either. Right? So uh, all of the growing industries are sub-industries of European capital, mostly German capital, and uh, a very key part of the regime's political economy is the German auto industry. So this is not to say Turkey doesn't depend on the European economy in the same way. Actually, Turkey's um, major trading partners, despite all of this anti-European uh, rhetoric, is still Westerners, okay? it's still Western countries. But you don't see this you know, kind of single industry dominating the whole ki uh, market kind of structure. So, of course, it's a matter of scale, too. We're talking about a country of 10 million as against a country of 80 million. And, of course, that's a part of the picture, too. It, it, it wouldn't pay Hungary very well to play uh, state capitalism and war capitalism in the same way. So it's state capitalism that is very defensive. So it, it, it still is integrated as a dependent partner of German capitalism and it really doesn't have a vision to change any of that despite, the, uh, despite all of the rhetoric. And of course, this doesn't mean uh, I'm downplaying its anti-EU stance because it is trying to change EU. You know, it's trying to, uh, the Hungarian right is trying to make EU more anti-immigrant, more anti-feminist, more <laughs> anti-LGBTQ, but this is really not uh, searching for a sub-imperial role against the EU in any sense. No migration, no gender, no war. Yeah, we are also anti-war. <laughs> uh, and this is um, an imitation now of American conservatism. Uh, the uh, CPAC is the organizing ground for the American radical right. Once it was the organizing ground for the center right, but the center right doesn't organize anymore. So the radical right has appropriated that game in the United States and Orban is trying to do uh, the same and trying to turn this into a base for the reorganization of the European right. So Poland, despite the, you know, Similarities I have emphasized, yeah, it is anti-LGBTQ, it's, you know, I mean the government, it is anti-feminist, it is anti-immigrant, etc. But beneath all of these 
similarities, there is a very important uh, difference. And that difference is that Polish route to neoliberalism has been worker stamped, but in a very twisted way. So it's not, you know, like a proletarian organization really controlling neoliberalization. It's not like that. It's very unintended and very twisted. But that has created a state capitalism actually much healthier than in uh, Turkey or Hungary. So what do I mean by that? Well, we, we first need to have a very basic understanding of Solidarność. Of course, it's, you know, it's one of the most important movements of world history, so I, I can't do it justice here. But I'll just simplify it by saying Solidarność, even though it's a worker-led movement, it's a workers' movement, organized occasionally by engineers and others, but it's a workers, it's a labor movement, but it always denies its uh, worker identity, its proletarian identity, and it, it always presents itself as not economic. It's always like a political movement, but it's a militant political movement, of course, self-limiting militant movement. So why does any of this matter? Because in the 1990s, labor, as a, as a result of this le legacy, has slowed down neoliberalization and controlled neoliberalization in Poland, again, without intending it. And uh, as a result of this, industrial policy and state enterprises have been relatively shielded. I'm not saying there was no privatization. Yeah, many things have been privatized, but the most strategic sectors have not been privatized. Okay, so even banking. Yeah, there, there was some, you know, uh, cent central bank autonomy at some point in uh, Pol Polish neoliberalization, but the banks overall uh, were not completely privatized as in the rest of Eastern Europe. And uh, after 2008, after the financial crash, even the more relatively neoliberal, the most neoliberal party, uh, the Civic Platform, or PO, uh, its acronym, even that party slowed down privatization and undercut central bank autonomy and started to support national capitalists. So, you know, uh, the AKP and Erdogan are blamed for all of this in Turkey. Uh, and yeah, the Law and Ju Justice uh, Party in Poland are blamed for this. But the neoliberals themselves started to, you know, uh, cut some aspects of neoliberalism out before uh, the rights came to power in 2015. So the result of this is that the national capitalists in Poland never became as aggressive as they did in Hungary and Turkey. In Hungary, as I was saying, they became aggressive because of defensive reasons. I mean, they panicked, they over panicked. In Turkey, they became very aggressive as a result of imperial ambitions. But in, in Poland, yeah, yeah, I mean, they are still, I mean, national, aggressive national capitalists when compared to the rest of Eastern Europe, but when compared to uh, Hungarian and Turkish national capitalists, they are pretty benign people. And one result, or another result of this, is that there were very uh, comparable welfare policies in, uh, in Poland uh, to Turkey. Uh, contrast that to their absence in Hungary. So um, that, that's another way of saying uh, Polish right-wing populism is a populism with a heart, unlike the one in Hungary and like the one in Turkey. So let's not forget that Solidarność rallies were among history's largest organizations and events. This is now very important because Despite this, or maybe because of this, as I will discuss in a minute, Poland became one of the least civic countries in Eastern Europe. And among these three cases, definitely the least civic and the least, uh, the, the right-wing regime that depends the least on civic organization is Poland in this uh, three-country comparison. So why did this happen? So when we look at the 1990s, so by the end of the 1990s, Solidarność membership had dropped to one-tenth of its 1989 figures. One-tenth. That, that's an incredible decline. Yeah. 
Why would this happen? Because workers mobilized, and unlike in the 1980s, the engineers and the leaders of Solidarność didn't stand with the workers. Because the workers are mobilized in a different way. I mean, they mobilized against the neoliberal reforms without labeling their mobilization as such. But the leaders and engineers, the leaders of Solidarność and uh, the engineers of Solidarność, they, they, they were very clear about this. Oh my God, these, these people are trying to stop neoliberal reforms. So uh, they said, you know, these, these people are stuck in the past. This is awful. They're economistic, unlike, you know, our dear Solidarność, which was never economistic. And we are not going to go with them. So the movement split, basically. You know, that was the de death of Solidarność as we know it. And, you know, one uh, wing of Solidarność mutated into uh, the governing party, PIS, in, in Poland right now. So in this... Uh, overall atmosphere of declining civic activity where you know workers were shunned by engineers the intelligentsia too not just politicians the intelligentsia also said the same thing you know this is not the Poland we want these, these people are just trying to fight against uh, market reforms and they're trying to stick to their uh, communist um, privileges these privileges are ho horrible the intelligentsia was saying you know we have to teach them that this is not what Solidarność was about so the more the intellectuals said that, you know, the, peop the more people started to uh, stay at home. So that, that's how Poland became one of the most demobilized countries in the region. So in this overall atmosphere of demobilization, the far right was reborn, but it always had restricted impact because the PIS, the governing party, which was rooted in solidarity, which was rooted in Solidarność, unlike the AKP and Fidesz, unlike er the Erdoganists and the Orbanists, it distrusted and it still distrusts mass mobilization and mass organization. Or you're gonna say, I mean, come on, you know, pe people that the far rightists are mobilizing and demonstrating in Poland and the government sides with them. Yes, but it's, it's very surface. It's, very, it's a surface coalition, unlike in uh, Turkey, where the party is you know, organizing the grassroots. And Orban is at least trying to do this. We can discuss how successful he is. But uh, the, uh, the Polish leaders, the Polish right-wing leaders, just pay lip service to this, then essentially do nothing, expect, uh, except showing up. You know, and, uh, behaving as if they really care. My reading is that they, they don't really care. They, they don't actually want this. But they say, enable some activity, but they don't organize the activity. So unlike uh, Fidesz and the AKP, the, the party's role is not an enabling role. It is, uh, sorry, it's not an organizing role. It is an enabling role. So today I would say um, except the welfare policies, which I ca called, you know, pop populism with a heart, Polish populism is very much from above, unlike especially Turkish populism. So there is no integral party in Poland. There is a party and there are some fascists, but these are not integrated. There is no integral party. One indicator of this is that the Turkish party has 11 million members, the Polish party has 40,000 members. Well, we should all, always distrust these uh, you know, figures. You know, what does 11 million mean? I mean we, we are not talking about really 11, peop 11 million people who are really cadres. Of course not. But still, I mean, it shows you something. And w when you look at the uh, activities on the ground, uh, there, there is something more. It's not just you know, paper membership. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, these people are paper members, but a lot of them are not. So Europe's largest right-wing rally, yes, it is held in Poland, I know. But it has maxed at 200,000 people with all of these you know, uh, non-Polish uh, fanatics participating in these events. And in Turkey, you can uh, easily uh, mobilize millions uh, of far-rightists on the streets. So, 
So these differences from Hungary and Poland go hand in hand. I mean, they're not reflections of each other, of course. I'm not saying, you know, one of these axes of the regimes explains the others. The, these three are articulated to each other, the political economy, the civic legacies, and now uh, the reckoning with the imperial balances. So as different from uh, Fidesz, the PIS has no strong anti-EU stance. Of course, it's against anti-EU values, but it's not against European expansion. It's not against the deepening of the integration of the EU. And as importantly, it is very strongly anti-Russia. Actually, the party sees its priority as being anti-Russia rather than being anti-EU values. Whereas, you know, for uh, Fidesz, the priority is clearly, you know, foreign policy uh, priority is being against the values of the EU, if not against the EU itself. But uh, along with those differences between Hungary and Poland, there is an important similarity. Both countries lack any sub-imperial ambitions. So despite this strong state capitalism, there is no real war capitalism in Poland. It, this doesn't mean they don't love war, but they love war only as an extension of the NATO. So uh, they, they go, I mean, the F Polish right goes as far as inviting an independent non-NATO American military basis on its territory. So, I mean, they're pretty militaristic, but they don't have war capitalism of their own. They, they just want to be an extension of American war capitalism. So another way of saying that is that, that state capitalist legacies in Poland are not integrated into war industries, sub-imperial ambitions and civic mobilization. They're rather, the, the state capitalism as it exists in Poland is a very developmental one. Okay. And that arguably also prevents uh, Poland from uh, shifting further and further to the right. So anything like the blue homeland, sub-imperial fantasy in Poland, I don't think it was even that, but you know, its closest counterpart is the Three Seas Initiative, but it doesn't have an accumulation vision, you know, it doesn't have a production vision. It was mostly like a trade integration, and even that didn't work out. So uh, Poland couldn't even lead a, tr a peaceful trade integration, let alone, you know, having sub-imperial ambitions. So, okay, I am wrapping up. So, just to remind you of the overall arc of the talk. So, neoliberalization disintegrates societies, it impoverishes people, it disorganizes people, but the people respond. And of course, there are other kinds of responses too, which I haven't covered. I mean, there's Gezi, there's the Kurdish movement, there's, uh, there are workers' movements in all three countries, but I focused on right-wing responses, the con cons uh, conservative counter-movement to neoliberalization. So in, in uh, Turkey, the uh, right-wing counter-movement to neoliberalism has shaped up as aggressive war capitalism, whereas in Hungary it has shaped up as defensive state capitalism. But let me emphasize that this you know, counter-movement idea doesn't mean these countries are now against neoliberalism as such. They're still a part of the neoliberal world and its uh, trade balances, and they hope to benefit from that neoliberalism, and they still do deepen, uh, for example, neoliberal employment policies, and neoliberal uh, shop floor policies. The, the work regime is still neoliberal. It's isolating, it's flexible, uh, and it's disorganizing, uh, well, with the caveat that, that there are these uh, corporatist unions in Turkey. So I have tried to argue that immigration policy is a, a, a result rather than the driver of, of all of these differences. It doesn't mean it's completely derivative. Of course, it's an important maker of this overall picture. But immigration in itself, or you know, being anti or pro-immigrant, doesn't make sense independent of all of these uh, changes in the political economy and uh, inter-imperial uh, repositioning of these countries. But I want to end with the question of how sustainable uh, this state capitalism and 
imperial fantasy can be in Turkey. So in the last two weeks, we witnessed how the president and many of his ideologues have gone in the other direction. So now uh, they're emphasizing economic orthodoxy, uh, they're emphasizing positive relations with Europe. Um, so it, it, that gives you a sense that state capitalism will not go very far. So today they're playing the pro-NATO game. But I would argue that this is a game too. So they, they will, in six months or 12 months, who knows, maybe 18, 18 months max, they will go back to their state capitalism, but that will not mean they won't ever go back to economic orthodoxy. So they're going to swing back and forth uh, quite frequently as they have. So I wouldn't change any, uh, I, I wouldn't expect any real change of track in Turkey in this regard. So I, I wouldn't expect any real, no, what, what do I mean by real? Um, I wouldn't expect any post-war type of state capitalism from even Turkey, let alone um, Hungary. And as I have been saying, perhaps Poland, you know, Poland's state capitalism is way more uh, sustainable and serious uh, than, than Turkey's. So t Turkey will not build a state capitalism as it did post 1930s and even more so uh, later on, uh, would be my uh, speculation. And the same thing with the pro immigration stance. So the, the government ha has done a lot of uh, you know, going back and forth on this too. So during the election campaign, uh, the op secular opposition was promising to deport uh, 4 million uh, refugees and immigrants. They don't even call them that. You know, they, they call them illegals or you know, scum or whatever. Um, they sometimes say 10 million. So they argue you know, that there are 10 million, not, not really 4 million. So they say they're going to deport all, all 10 of them. And as a concession to that, the AKP also said it's going to deport one million. Will it do that? Well, we'll see. Uh, but I, w I wouldn't bet on the AKP not doing that either. So it's, it's a very unpredictable party, and unpredictability is really a part of its game. Uh, and th that is not a simple choice, as I have been trying to emphasize. Uh, the party is unpredictable because neither neoliberalism nor pure state capitalism and nor sub-imperialism, a real imperialism uh, that goes beyond just being an extension of NATO, is really sustainable in Turkey. If, if you know, state capitalism and imperialism could turn into real things, then yes, I mean, these uh, four million or whatever refugees and immigrants could become a more mainstay of Turkey. I'm not saying citizens, but you know, subordinated populations within Turkey with some sort of secure, object, but secure existence. But because of all of this mixture of you know, nationalism, imperialism, neoliberalism, state capitalism, I, I don't find their pro-refugee stances very sustainable either. So I'll skip the point about civic legacies just to save time. And with this last note, I will end. Um, so the, the other contrast, so I, I made the contrast between Turkey and Poland. Uh, the, the, the contrast between Turkey and Hungary is as important, uh, despite both countries having very strong civic leg legacies of the far right. Um, the, the one in Turkey is much more integrated. It is much more hegemonic in this sense. Whereas uh, Hungary's uh, autocratic resilience has been less hegemonic. I won't say non-hegemonic, but it has been more policy-driven rather than really counting on this uh, deep, uh, deep presence within society. And um, maybe, maybe for discussion, we can talk about the future of mobilization in these countries and whether anything can be done uh, about any of these uh, autocracies. Thank you very much for your patience. And I would like to warmly welcome Erkin Erdogan. Um, he's, he was a, a scholar of Rosa Luxemburg Foundation uh, back in the days, and now he made his PhD in economics about Turkey, ec ecological and economical um, situation in Turkey. And he will facilitate uh, the talk and uh, 
have fun at the debate. I would like to uh, say some words about uh, Gian Tual. As you also know, he's a professor of sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he's author of several books. Uh, the recent one is called Caring for the Poor, published in 2017 by Rutledge. Uh, another book of his is called The Fall of the Turkish Model, How the Arab Up Uprisings Brought Down Islamic Liberalization, published in 2016. And uh, he has uh, a wide range of uh, research interests. He's researching in political sociology, uh, social theory, religion, economic sociology and development, social movements, uh, Middle East, comparative and historical sociology. And he published many articles in academic journals, uh, probably you stumbled over some of them, uh, such as uh, contemporary politics, critical sociology and annual review of soci sociology. And uh, his current research is uh, focusing on far right, neoliberalism, uh, state capitalism, and populism in Eastern Europe, Latin America, and West to uh, Latin America and West to Southeast Asia. And he's also writing extensively in Turkish language, <laughs> and uh, particularly after the election results. Uh, as far as I'm aware of, from social media, that he uh, got. Uh, quite uh, a presence in uh, particularly in lefty uh, uh, media and uh, his analysis and uh, his also the uh, components of his lecture that uh, leads us to understand better the structural components economic and social components of two decades of AKP rule were very influential inspiring and for many people I think it was helping to understand uh, uh, why uh, uh, Erdogan could win uh, again in 2023. And uh, I would like to uh, open the discussion by actually uh, bringing also the topic uh, to the elections and to the election results. And um, yeah, uh, as said, uh, I think presentation was very uh, inspiring. Also for me, I learned many things. And uh, for me particularly, what, what's particularly important is that the shifts of AKP rule in two decades, you did this uh, cast and uh, defined the first uh, decades, like 2000s, as the classical, not classical, but uh, so to say, some sort of classical uh, neoliberal era. And the second era, you define it as a uh, uh, neoliberal statist uh, regime. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what uh, we faced in the uh, five, six years of AKP rule, which was also discussed in the uh, left, uh, radical left uh, a lot in Turkey, as far as I'm aware of, that uh, this uh, period was also a period of uh, a shock in distribution. So there was uh, an economical challenge, inflation rates got high, because of AKP's uh, economic policy mainly, because they prioritized uh, import uh, sectors, uh, ex export sectors, uh, rather than the imports. And uh, this led to uh, a de declining share of uh, labor in the overall uh, uh, gross product. And uh, this led actually to many people and also the opposition that, uh, that many people expected an easy defeat of AKP actually, like <laughs> that they will fall immediately, suddenly, uh, actually without doing much. And this was even the, uh, probably uh, you also uh, followed from the media, this was even the uh, parole of the opposition, like be quiet, we are winning the election, so <laughs> everything will be all right when we are in the government. Uh, so my question is uh, uh, twofold. So on one hand, we saw the victory of Erdogan, uh, which is uh, certainly a success from his point. But on the other hand, I mean, this was not one election in the end. It was uh, an election with two rounds and plus there was the parliamentary elections. And in the parliamentary elections, we saw that AKP lost 6%, which is actually not discussed quite much. Uh, and uh, I would like to s ask you how you see these uh, results, in the f which has different uh, layers. Uh, do you think it was a clear win for AKP rule? And do you think they are more uh, confident in having more steps? Or do you think that uh, this was a... a difficult period for them and that's why they cannot 
do more or they cannot continue as they were. So that's why actually you also mentioned this in the end. Uh, is that why they uh, are uh, some kind of having shifts into more uh, classical orthodox policies and uh, yeah, uh, they're becoming um, uh, like a more loyal uh, partner of the West again. Is that, uh, but let me put it like this, how do you read the results of the elections? Yeah, quite good questions. Let me start from the very end. So are they really becoming orthodox again? As I said, I, I think there will be an orthodox phase. I, I just can't say whether it's going to be one month or two months or 18 months, but I think it's going to be short, relatively. So why are they doing this? Are they doing this because they kind of got hurt in the elections? They lost some ground? Possibly. But I think the real the reason they're doing this is much more structural. I, I think they simply need money. Like the, 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 the state capitalist turn also depends on uh, the, uh, fe the federal bank, the, I mean the central bank having some reserves and they're out of reserves. So they need money uh, from outside. And you know th this was the opposition's biggest promise, by the way. So they, they were, whenever they said anything about the economy, they were talking about raising interest rates so that uh, the global cash flow would be restored. And this is exactly what Erdogan did as soon as he uh, came to power. He appointed one of his uh, prior, but one of his pre previous uh, f finance ministers who was uh, more orthodox than the other ones. So that's not what they're doing, uh, but I think they're doing this because of structural reasons and they will get this money. And again, my speculation is that once the money is secure, once there is some uh, f uh, flow back of global cash, uh, they will again uh, appropriate this money for state capitalist purposes, and then they will revert back to state capitalism. And I think, by the way, um, I think there's some uh, there are some delusions about this in Turkey, in in, in the Turkish opposition. They, they, some people, not, I, I won't say a lot of people, some people are buying into this that they're going back to orthodoxy. But I don't think uh, the Western powers are falling for this. I think that they're doing a more careful read of the situation. So they kind of expected an Erdogan win anyway. Uh, they, they were less uh, surprised than the people in Turkey. And now I think they're less uh, hopeful than the people in Turkey uh, about Erdogan becoming orthodox again. I, I think this is like a very short phase. They will collect the money and they will uh, go back to state capitalism. But as I'm saying, I'm not taking the state capitalism extremely seriously either. So that, that, has a short, that will also have a short lifespan and they will again go back to orthodoxy. Uh, but this doesn't mean they didn't lose ground in the elections. They did lose ground. I'm just saying the orthodox turn is not a response to that. The orthodox turn, in my reading, is a re response to structural reasons. So why did that uh, lo uh, loss of ground occur? So if, if as I'm saying, they're so rooted in society and uh, they have fed so many people, etc., why did they lose any ground? Um, they, they lost ground, but th th let's be very careful about this. So Erdogan didn't lose votes, right? Or not, not much anyway. So the party lost votes. So as, as, you, I mean, as, as you carefully said, the presidential vote didn't go bad for them, but uh, the parliamentary uh, vote uh, did go bad for the AK party, for Erdogan's party. But all of the votes they lost went to their uh, fascist coalition partner. So we, we have to read it in that context. So the lost votes didn't go to the center right or the center left or the far left. The, the votes lost by the radical right went to the radical right. And not even like warring factions of the radical right, but you know, that these are coalition partners. So what does this mean? Again, of course, I mean, this is, there, this is going to be some interpretation, but uh, not out of thin air. Uh, this is interp interpretation based on you know, journalistic reports and whatever we know from the polls. Um, it looks like pe people are somewhat upset with what's happening, but they don't see an alternative. So they don't see whatever the opposition is saying as an alternative. So they, I'm of course talking about the government, government uh, you know, Erdogan and uh, fascist supporters, not, not the other half of Turkey. So half of Turkey, they are upset, but they don't see an alternative. So how does this translate into the vote? 
they want their voice heard, just like in the metal storm, just like during these strikes. They want their voice heard, but they don't want to topple Erdogan. They don't want to seriously hurt the party either. They don't want Turkey to change track. So uh, the, both the national capitalists and uh, the working class, they want to stick to this uh, war capitalism and imperialism is my read of the situation. So this is how you do it. You know, if, if you want to uh, say to Erdogan and the AK party, well, we don't like everything you're doing, but you're on the right track. So what do you do? I mean, you go vote for the fascist partner. Uh, so I, I, that, that's my read of the situation. Of course, that's like very reductionist because there are other things going on. I mean, the, one other component of the picture, but I mean, that, that's my main message. So I, I want to you know, highlight that. But there are other things going on, such as, uh, at least for this election cycle, nationalism was as important or perhaps way more important than religion. So that, that's why we see a vote shifting from the Islamic party to the fascist party, or the Islamic fascists from the Islamic fascists to the nationalist fascists, if you want to call it that. Um, but I, I see this as temporary, so I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, Turkey is changing identity again. It's, you know, it was secular, and then it became Islamic, and now it's becoming national. It's, I don't think it's like that. I think uh, the main story is that a national war capitalism is being established, and these are all uh, maneuvers within that national war capitalism. You know, it has liberal components, it has Islamic components, it has fascist components, but it's not just any one of these. It's a mixture of liberalism, fascism, and Islamism. Thank you. And second question of mine is related to uh, the core of your analysis, you, which is uh, uh, neoliberal statism. Uh, you call uh, or you uh, uh, use the term uh, state capitalism, as far as I'm understanding, let me correct, uh, please correct me if I'm getting it wrong, like state-led capitalism, as far as I understand. And uh, the industries which are being uh, uh, organized and structured even by the state-led, uh, 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 which by the government, let's say, and uh, and you also say that uh, statism is actually eroding uh, neoliberalism in your uh, in one of your research articles. I would like to ask, and as far as I understand, you also tell or name this uh, phase as uh, neoliberal statism because you think or you claim that there is a change in capital accumulation. We, now we can define it with uh, states, uh, neoliberal statism in a much better way. So I would like to ask uh, to which level this uh, eroding of uh, neoliberalism occurs in uh, Turkey example, in Turkish example. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that, that's a very good summary of what I'm saying actually and thanks for you know, preemptively correcting any misunderstanding. Uh, it's exactly as you said, you know, I, by state capitalism, I don't mean state is the only employer now. Okay, I mean, so I, I know it's a very, like like all terms, I mean, there, there are no innocent or easy terms. Just like all other contentious terms, state capitalism might mean, or has meant, very different things to different factions of the left, uh, different Marxists, etc. So, for one, uh, you know, uh, Marxist tradition, state capitalism has meant state is the main employer, or maybe the only employer in town. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't employ for socialist pur purposes; it uh, employs for uh, accumulation purposes. But I don't mean that. I, I mean it's more in a Bukharian sense. So it's Bukharian rather than cliff uh, in this context. So Bukharian uh, first used this term in the sense that uh, even the major capitalists must, might still be private, but there is growing state ownership. But uh, more important than that, the state's role is becoming organizational. So not just you know trade illiberalization, not just you know the control of money, but uh, production is organized by the state, even if uh, on uh, in legal terms the employers might be private capitalists. Uh, so Bukharin uh, used this term for uh, you know post uh, the emergent capitalism of the nine uh, post 1910s. 
So he said, you know, that this is this is the direction in which the, uh, capitalism is going to go uh, from now on. And I, I think he was basically right up until the 1970s. So this, uh, the, the the world w went in that way. The mo most of the world, most of the Western world, went in that way. But I think, uh, quite counterintuitively and ironically, today China is the leader of this. So uh, state is a big ownership, uh, st state ownership is a big part of the ownership, uh, but there are more and more and even growing, uh, significantly growing private capitalists. But still markets and the stock market and you know, employers associations are not organizing production, it's still the state that is organizing productive cycles. So that's what Chinese capitalism is doing. And the, the whole question is, is Turkey uh, going that way? And as, as I said in the talk, if, if there's any strong counterpart uh, of any of this in the region, I think it's really Poland more than Turkey um, in terms of you know, looking like China. But in terms, of, in terms of looking like Bismarck Germany, maybe Turkey is closer to that because you know, it is very, very much integrated to you know, imperial uh, ambitions and whatnot. But let me add one twist to all of this. So th there is a very important difference between what Buharin called state capitalism and today's Chinese state capitalism. And that is, um, when we talk about state capitalism in post-war uh, post world, post-war Western world, uh, they're the states that we're talking about independent imperial states, the leading states. But Chinese state capitalism is very much dependent, as I said in passing during the talk, it is very dependent on uh, the American market. So without American neoliberalism, you don't have Chinese state capitalism. So that, that's a mind-blowing difference. So what, what enables state capitalism on the scale of China is Western neoliberal demand. So that's worldwide speaking. So when it comes to Turkey and, and Poland, we see a similar picture. So these state capitalisms, uh, Hungary included, even in a much more restricted way, these state capitalisms are very, very neoliberal as I said, both in their employment regimes, uh, flexible working conditions, shop floor discipline, they're all neoliberal, but they're also neoliberal in the sense that they are dependent on the, the world market. Uh, you know, the German market and the ger German employers even, not just the market in the, in the case of Hungary, so that, that's a deeper dependence, but even Poland and Turkish capitalisms are uh, very integrated uh, into the Western world and neither China nor Turkey nor Poland are really uh, seeking to overthrow that dependence. They don't, they don't have that vision. So, you know, that, that's a structural reason why this state capitalism will never turn into a post-war kind of state capitalism. And from here, I would like to come to your analysis of, uh, of, of reading Turkey as a sub-imperialist force in the region. Uh, I also, I mean, you mentioned that this is, uh, this has several reasons. One reason, as far as I understood from the uh, lecture, that uh, is that uh, the um, retreat of US in the region, so there is some uh, some possibilities for Turkey to intervene, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I also read this as uh, an increasing uh, self-confidence of uh, Turkish capitalism, uh, because in the first decade of uh, AKP rule, uh, the GDP per capita, for example, increased from 3, 000, about 3,000 euros dollars to 10,000 dollars. So there was a threefold increase in the uh, GDP per capita, and uh, Turkish uh, companies, uh, firms uh, were operating throughout the region in uh, Middle East, in uh, North Africa, uh, particularly with Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. The trade boomed in extensive uh, figures, and so Turkey was feeling quite uh, confident and after the Arab uh, Spring uh, then they became more and more active in this policy. Uh, but what uh, I also ha see and feel like that this uh, policy of uh, trying to use uh, the regional tensions for the uh, 
uh, interest of uh, Turkish capitalism was not actually bringing a better position for Turkey. <laughs> it brought more problems, <laughs> more conflicts, and uh, in the end, the policy of uh, first, uh, the foreign policy of uh, first decade of AKP was zero problem with neighbors. And then in the second uh, decade, the, yeah, the, many people say this is a uh, funny, uh, funny aspect that there was no neighbor where AKP didn't have serious problem uh, and conflict. So uh, do you think that uh, the sub-imperialism uh, component will play an important role in the uh, next decade or next 100 years of uh, Turkey? 100 is too big, I don't know. <laughs> I, I hope not. Uh, well, it depends on us too. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not just uh, the AKP who chooses, right? Um, well, it, that, that's a very good point. So, in the beginning, uh, this sub-imperialism, which was, I, sh I should add, closer to classical sub-imperialism, and I'll explain what I mean by that, th that made capitalists very happy. And uh, not, not just pro-AKP capitalists or pro-Islamic capitalists, but also non-Islamic capitalists were very happy about uh, what Turkey was doing trade with uh, the Middle East and, you know, penetration of Iraqis uh, markets. And then uh, with the Arab Spring, there was a little more of an aggressive move, not too aggressive in the very first year. The thinking was that what we, what we were doing peacefully in Iraq, now we can do throughout Africa. Uh, so uh, Erdogan went to uh, Egypt in the within the first year of the Arab Spring with 500 Turkish capitalists and this was not war capitalism yet so it's not th th these capitalists were not uh, all not all of them not not most of them were war, uh, war or uh, you know sub war industry capitalists they were you know uh, the textile and all, all sorts of uh, capitalists not heavily metal okay uh, so the, the vision was still uh, sub imperialism in a you know, like an, uh, with an American bent, or p primarily a NATO bent, really. So, what do I mean by classical sub-imperialism? In, in the sub-imperialism literature, the sub-imperial po po uh, power is something like today's Poland. So, it's, it's, an ex it's aggression, Poland's aggression today is an extension of NATO aggression. It's not, it's not trying to play NATO and Russia against each other. It's not claiming to be an in independent imperial power. So Turkey was sub-imperial in that sense, not in the sense of you know, having its own distinct imperial uh, vision. So when that is the case, the real war maker is still the major imperialist power. Right? So d Turkey doesn't have to uh, bloody ha its hands that much when that is the case. Or you know, when it shoots, it just shoots as an extension of the US. But after the Arab Spring failed to bring in the kind of regimes that the AKP wanted, you know, the liberal Islamic regimes, these 500 capitalists uh, that Erdogan took to uh, Egypt, most of them were useless. Well, some of them stayed actually, so that, that's not like a black and white picture either. And ma many, ma some of those capitals stayed in Egypt and they, you know, they're over-exploitative, they're, they're very anti-labor. So they, you know, they, they are playing the classical uh, neoliberal game uh, with, with Egypt, e even when you know, er Erdogan was uh, on bad terms with Sisi, those capitals were there. But after the failure of the Ar Arab Spring, sub-imperialism and Turkish sub-imperialism started to become more independent, right? And uh, again, within the last two weeks, we are getting the sense that Turkey might be s seeking to re-institute its uh, dependence on the U.S. Um, but just like you know, orthodox e economic policies, just like high interest rates, I, s uh, I see this too as a passing game. Now they need to play this, and what will they get out of this? So uh, for those of you who have not been following, uh, what's being discussed in public, what Erdogan is saying in public, is that um, we will accept Sweden's NATO membership if you accept Turkey into the European Union. I don't think that's what he has in mind. I, I, don't, I don't think he's stupid. 
uh, or delusional. Well, sometimes he's delusional, but not about this. He's not that delusional. Uh, he, he knows uh, Turkey cannot become a part of the EU. Um, so I, I think that's just for, you know, the audiences. But what's really being debated, I think, is you know the uh, war planes deal uh, with the U.S. and maybe some other things we don't know. I, I, I can only speculate. I, I, don't, I don't think uh, they are really declaring what they are fighting about. But uh, it seems certain that Turkey is going to accept uh, Sweden's NATO membership and is going to get something in return. Is it going to get uh, something more than these uh, F-16s from the U.S.? I don't know that part, but my guess is, you know, the F-16s is really a big part of this, and there might be something uh, else in the deal too. Uh, okay, th th that, that was too many details, but the, the, the short of the story is that I think this, this game is going to last as long as, or almost as long as, uh, the economic orthodoxy game. Um, sooner or later, Turkey is going to start to sound anti-NATO again. It's uh, going to play its own sub-imperial game again. But as I have been saying, I don't find that sustainable either. So uh, the short version to your question is neither in the next 10 years nor in the next 100 years, I, I don't see Turkish imperialism as sustainable or viable. Um, but having said that, let me add one last thing. There are many people in the Turkish military establishment, uh, in the is Islamic intelligentsia, who are thinking along these lines. So they are thinking, okay, uh, maybe we can't do much in the next two, three years. Yeah, I mean, we, there, there's going to be a lot of fluctuation. We, we are going to give in a lot. We, we can't be, become a real imperial power, but we know that the U.S. is declining and it will ultimately fall. We know that the EU is not going anywhere. It's going to be an ineffective power. We know the rise of China doesn't mean there is going to be complete Chinese hegemony. Uh, hegemony. So Turkish imperialism is viable and sustainable. That, that's, not, that, that's what they're thinking. I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you this as what I am thinking. But th that is the thinking. You know, I mean, th there is going to be more and more stalemate with no clear world hegemon, and in, in this game, you know, Turkey can become one of the real imperial powers of the world if the AKP stays in power for another 50 years. So that's the thinking. I mean, they're, they're thinking about, sometimes they say 30 years, sometimes 50, but I mean, they're thinking in those terms, not next 10 years, as you were saying, you know, next 100 years. They are thinking in those terms. I find that semi-delusional, but I mean, there's some, some real basis to this, because even though, you know, the fall of the U.S. might be exaggerated, the disintegration of the EU might be uh, exaggerated a little, and Turkey's capacity is very much exaggerated by the AKP intelligentsia, but there is some basis to all of this, and we do see this in the war industries of Turkey and in the drone in industry, for example. It's just that, you know, in their imagination, this is overblown. So I'm not saying there aren't any, there aren't any delusions, but I, I, I am saying I don't find them completely delusional.